wonderful, wonderful viewpoints that we managed to gather. We're now going to quickly give a makeover to the stage and get started with the panel discussion. We already have our esteemed panelists who are already here inside the hall. So let's get the session started. Check. All right. But before I invite our speakers on stage, uh, let me also share with you and set the context for the panel discussion. In fact, uh, uh, in the last few conferences that I was hosting, a lot of uh, uh, speakers kept talking about the fact, the one term that we also are pretty much aware, something we've been hearing in the news portals to do with recession. And this is where it also brings us to a lot of questions that if recession is happening, how is India going to respond to it? Um, but at the same time, while that is the economic perspective, which is for another day, uh, the big question that we all want to uh, answer is to do with recession-proof marketing. And that's where we're going to get these strategies for the CMOs to navigate the economic turmoil. We're going to gather these strategies from our several speakers who are going to join us in a short while. Uh, we all know that marketing is essential throughout any financial crisis. Now, the silver lining for marketing organizations during the economic downturns is that recessions may be used to develop new methods, new methods to contribute while also broadening the organization's understanding of the value that the marketing provides which is why this session will assist CMOs in better aligning marketing strategies and also setting up business objectives in order to sail through the recession. Big topic coming your way, so let me quickly invite our speakers. First up, I'd like to invite Ankit Desai, Marketing Director Hershey, to please come on stage. If I could please invite, all right, right over here. Meanwhile, let me go ahead and invite our next set of speakers. We have with us Madhu Datta, Head of Marketing, Brand, Media and Social, Raymond. May I also invite Sri Hari Palangla, Head of Marketing, Dell. Suprati Sain Gupta, Head of Marketing, Consumer Health, Lupin. And to spearhead the session, we have with us Jay Bhuva, Partner, Deloitte, India. If I could please invite all our speakers, including Ankit Desai, to please come on stage. So Ankit will be joining us in a minute. And uh, let's have all the speakers take your seats. So I believe Ankit will be joining us in about a minute, but I believe Jay is already over here. He's moderating and spearheading the session. So I'll quickly hand it over to you meanwhile to also set the tone, set the context for the session, and then go to you. Hello. Yes. Great. Um, while we wait, good afternoon, everybody. It's fantastic to be here. Um, amazing panel that I'm accompanied here with. And um, I love the topic. The topic says, what do we do in recession? And CMOs, as we know, are the first where chief financial officers and CEOs turn to and say, hey, you know, the, the metrics are not looking great. What can we do with the marketing budget? Can we cut down on certain things? Um, how can we look at return on the marketing investment that, are, that we are doing more closely? But that reminds me of a quote by one of the best Racers, uh, late Mr. Senna, he says, You possibly cannot overtake 15 cars on a sunny day, but you can on a rainy day. There are hundreds of cases where fantastic brands have been able to overtake and shine in the times of recession and financial crisis. Uh, it isn't easy. There are, there are fantastic examples all around us in India and globally, but what does it take to really master that? How do we change our tone? How do we stay true to our purpose? How do we change strategy? Where do we divert our budget? How can we bring in innovation? Short term versus long term? All of that. We have some fantastic panelists to, to answer those questions. And if I can start the conversation by Akit yourself, What's your view when, when recession ends and, and there are negative metrics all around? What should be the strategy of continuing to build the brand? How should an organization maneuver that? So first of all, I'm just worried, Mr. Bijur, because we have passed 23 minutes. So is this the time when the alcohol sets in or? It's in already. 
So, uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, the only way to accelerate growth uh, during highs and to continue growing during lows is to invest behind the brand. That's the only way. Uh, which typically uh, one tends to pull the plug on brand building, but I firmly believe that that's the last thing brand should do. That's one. Secondly, I do feel that physical availability and mental availability go hand in glove. So if you are making your brand physically available, uh, then you have to invest behind making it mentally available as well. Uh, and uh, thus, so yeah, that's that's my perspective. So the last thing a brand should do or an organization do should do is cut the brand building budgets uh, during the months. Okay. So continue investing in building the brand. Um, Madhu, you are closer to consumers. Your brand is consumer brand. Um, would you like to extend? Hi, I mean, firstly, I mean, thank you very much. It's an immense pleasure to be here amongst such a august company. Um, taking it forward, I think I'm in full alignment with what you said. Uh, however, I also feel that uh, end of the day, a brand, the existence of a brand is because of the consumers. So therefore, you know, you cannot, during a time of low, you cannot be just alienating the consumer. It's very important that you stay with the consumers, you bring in the best to them and the deeper connection that you can build in, I think that takes a long way for a long term relationship and continuing that narrative around the brand with the consumers. So therefore pulling in the plug is a very uh, you know, knee jerk kind of a, a way of looking at things because it's a very short term. Because short term doesn't take you further. I think it one has to look long term in terms of uh, how you are building the future because that is, those are the times Difficult times are when you build the future and that's how a brand should uh, operate as well. Great and I agree because there is, there is a study by Edelman which says 68% of consumers believe that they have the power to change organizations and corporations and that belief is rooted in the very expectation that the brands exist just like how you say because of them not the other way around. Um, if I have to pass it to you Supadeek, what do you feel are some of the strategies that you have seen work in recent times or even otherwise uh, that might be relevant for our audience? Yeah, hi. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you ETH for inviting us here. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, again I would quote Mr. Gidu that uh, I remember your class saying the visiting faculty at the time class. So, uh, in, the, in the world of self-pleasure, alpha gen, hedonistic narcissist society, I think we are talking about this session, is, is a very drab kind of subject, but I would take a little bit different perspective. I think if I take the economist definition of what is recession, uh, they define it as two successive quarter of negative GDP growth. That is the definition of recession. And as a marketeer, we always think of consumer, but when a kind of recession hits you, I think recession is a kind of, I would say, a ecosystem effect. It's not just happening with your organization, with your brand. It's the entire society is going through the recession. And that is affecting even your employees, even your marketing partners like research agency, your advertising agency. So when you are fighting with the recession, as a team where your marketing partners are very important, they need to be agile, they need to bring in probably a new communication, your research partner needs to find new insight. But the decision as a, as, a, as a mindset had struck everybody. And I think we missed that point sometimes. That there is a people factor of the decision also. It's not about just keeping the brand investment right. It is also to keep the people in the context that okay, when the decision is happening, your team needs to be motivated. Your teams need to be agile. And I think we forget that now. And as a strategy, I think when we look at this decision, and I think all of us had to come out of a pandemic, which I think no Kotler, no Porter can teach you how to manage that, how to manage it with time. In the history of mankind, that never happened. I work in a pharma company, though in the consumer health care side. But think of a situation where globally 100% of the hospitals are occupied. Never happened in the history of mankind. So in that case, when that happens, it's not just about the brand investment or convincing CFO, I don't know if there is any CFO here. 
2006 year for that don't cut my bad budget, Mr. Good Money. It's not a bad money. I think the most important part, or the same, or equally important part, is to understand the people factor when you are dealing with decisions. So I, I will leave with that, and maybe we can take it forward later. Sure. Thank you. So keep people at the center. Continue investing in the brand. But Sherry, what's your viewpoint? We we all came out strong from COVID, and and when we keep people at the center. What does it really mean on the ground for a yeah. company like yours, which is more B2B? Yeah, um, fair, uh, fair question, Jay. And again, uh, you know, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, ET, likewise, you know, thank you for having us here. Uh, so I sort of extend what Supratik said, right? He talked about it from a people perspective within the organization <clears throat> and also to what Ankit was talking about. In my mind, a couple of things are high on the radar. One is, um, it's probably the time that you have to be even more paranoid than you were normally are. Right? Uh, it's the time where, uh, you know, the way you've normally done, done, done things, and I think what Harish was talking about earlier, it's probably something you need to revisit. So as an example, right, if you think about it from your employees, your team perspective, Supratik talked about it. You talk from your customer's perspective. You know, under situations which were steady state, broad brush things were okay, right? You probably got away with your messages which were fairly broad brushed. But that's not going to work in my mind at this point. Because you need to be closer to what's really resonating in their mind and talk to that. So whether, and I know Harish talked about this and he said targeting is sort of whatever, a little bit different, but to that segment, to that target, what's top of mind to them? Is that stemming from the empathy that you have? Is that stemming from whatever else that you need to communicate? I think we need to start re-looking at that. And if you can get into a platform or a place where you can communicate externally to that proposition of what's highest in their mind, I think this is the time to do it. And you can do that only if you're constantly paranoid. If you're thinking that you're in a little bit of a steady state, you're probably going to overlook that. So that's one. It marries very, very quickly with what happens internally as well. It doesn't help for marketers to go out there and make very close propositions to audiences. Right? Let me give you an example. Right? Maybe some customers okay, are concerned about how they finance your solution. Maybe some are concerned about your, your competition and evaluating against that. Maybe some are concerned in some markets about the energy and the challenges they're having about that. You know, so each market might be very different about what's top of mind for them. So spend the time thinking about it. And most importantly, make sure internally you've communicated that too. Right? And your internal audience is also taking that same message in, in residence to, to that audience. That's a lovely message, Fred. Thank you for that. I, I like two aspects of what you say. It brings out the best of an organization when we are going through a session, so it can almost separate kids from adults, right, in their voice, uh, but also a segment of one. Today, it, it really is so much possible to look at every individual as a segment of one, rather than creating a cohort and saying, look, I'm going to only brand my offerings to you in this particular way because we believe you belong to this group, where the group is only that guy, that one single person. Is the organization ready? to be able to do that um, is a question. And, and during the times of a session, it becomes apparent when the organizations are ready and when they are not ready. Now, how do you define that readiness, Madhu, if I can ask? What does an organization need to do to be ready um, in order for this hyper-personalization, call it innovation, having many projects? Because innovation is the last thing that comes to mind when, when we are going through recession. What's your take on that? One more, most important thing during this point of time is understanding the consumer. Who is your consumer? And therefore, because this is the time that you are, you need to be very cognizant about what are the steps you are taking and what are the repercussions around that step. So therefore, understanding the consumer and therefore, you know, dovetailing different, as you rightly said, that today, each in a, in a group of 10, each one is an individual by himself or herself. 
So therefore, understanding that particular uh, individual, that's where I think data comes in very importantly in, in our uh, understanding of that. Because then you analyze the behavioral pattern, analyze what that consumer is looking. Because today, as we all know, that everything is so networked. You know an individual by just the name, by just the phone number, by just the email ID. So therefore, customization and reaching out to that person for that particular need is very, very important, and especially in, in, in certain categories as well. Whereas, and especially I work in a category which is a uh, discretionary category. During a recession, last thing people would want to get into, you know, buying fashion apparel, for example. So therefore, you know, what is the need of it? You need to be very sensitive about the fact that keeping the environment and keeping the, you know, mindset of people at that point in time, that how you are addressing that person. So therefore, I guess it's very important as an organization or as a brand to be sensitive towards what messaging you are giving, to be sensitive towards what the need of the hour is and keeping oneself relevant to that particular need of the hour. Sure. So what's what's top of mind for them? What are they going through? What's their context? It's important that we understand that. But the question really is, what are the building blocks um, okay, for an organization to be able to do that? I mean, everybody would, would aspire to be in a state where they are agile enough as an organization to be able to, to react to the changing dynamic consumer need and their state of affair. But what does it take for an organization? I think first, what enables it is important. And I completely agree with her that continuous listening and staying close to the consumer is very important. We are in FMC extremely dynamic. And we have our tracks. Uh, measurement mechanism and inciting which we do to be able to tap into what, how the consumer behavior trends, liking is changing, so that is very important. The second part of it is the enablement happens when you do very rigorous cost management. You need to be uh, on top of uh, cutting down discretionary spends so that you are doing what's good for the consumer in line with what is in sync with his or her trends. So that's the second part of it. To your point around core and innovations, I think it's a known fact that strengthening the core is extremely important. But what we what we saw very closely and following through it today is post-pandemic or from the start of pandemic, we are seeing consumers looking for newness. Uh, they're looking for new news. They're looking for micro occasions. Uh, and and which is where innovations play a nice role to get you that incremental and engaging better with consumers. Right. Incremental lift um, and, and that is what the ask that the consumers have. So the organization must have those capabilities as well. So if I can if I can ask you my, my next question which is which is on my head is COVID changed a lot of journeys and you know mishmash the online and offline when you spoke about uh, e commerce becoming due to C and you name it differently, but basically it's the ability to, to track the customer's interest across different journeys and still be able to solve in the way that they are looking at. Um, what's your take from a marketing standpoint to be able to, to react to that journey which is more like our retail drones, you know, it's going from that basis. So I will draw from what we did not being too specific, but I would like to. So, even be it recession, be it COVID, uh, what we understood is that uh, maybe you need to defocus from consumer acquisition to focus more on the, the cost of acquisition is always retaining attention. And what happens that when a consumer buys a brand, what he or she is doing, he is actually short-circuiting a decision-making process. See, if I buy a bottle of water or, or anything for that matter, now if there are five bottles out here and none of them are labeled, probably you, you think that, okay, do I need to taste the water and the quality and all this. But the moment you put a label, A, B, C, and then another known label, then you will reach out for the known label because you have created a decision already that okay this brand is can be trusted. So it's a decision short circuiting which we are doing instead of 
taking the decision in the entire consumer journey map. Okay. So it is better to retain the consumer because of the consumer in the system than creating an acquisition because acquisition is a longer loop. Okay. And it need more interference into that journey map. You need more investment into those journey map. But a consumer who is already in your fold, probably you can retain him uh, at a lower cost. So that is one focus. Second, mm, I think if I look at from a outside the consumer side or a, a combination of operation and consumer side, there are three things which we, which we usually focus on. One is uh, 3D, we call it decentralized uh, discipline and digital or digitization. Uh, we all know about the e-com and the impact of D2C and all so, what happens that when there is a decision, it gives you some time, some opportunity to do some experimentation. So the digitization can happen during that time because there are a lot of physical costs you save in that process. Discipline is something which basically you bring in in terms of the process, you cut down certain tab and all these things. The decentralization is an interesting thing which we found. Uh, I think one of us talked about going closer to the consumer. And when you go closer to the consumer, probably you need to decentralize. You need to empower your frontline to, to take decision uh, rather than going all the way back to your regional office or HO and then again giving an approval. So that uh, in a way helps in terms of creating a more agile and kind of adaptive situation. In decision, you need to be agile and adaptive. So this is broadly one side. The second uh, side was basically we tried to look at the consumer segment so broadly without going into a particular category. Broadly, my experience is primarily from CGOTC. Okay. So I'll talk about that. Is that uh, when the decision happens, what happens to the consumer? Two things happen. One, at a, at a, at a tangible level, his disposable income goes down. The second thing also happens, even if it is not going drastically, in the anticipation of it might get hampered or hindered, he, he goes into a kind of shell in terms of the expenditure what he or she is doing and then he start prioritizing and broadly you can bucket it in three things. One is I need it. There are certain things I need. It. I need food. I need certain amount of things. Then there are things which I thought I would need but I don't need. Okay? So this is, this is a hard break that I don't need. The third part which is interesting. I don't need it now. Now, taking the case of uh, a computer, a Dell or a Raymond or a Hush, uh, maybe in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the life of a hard decision, I still might need a chocolate time. Maybe you can create that sense that, okay, there is a need to create a certain amount of chocolate time. I am. You only chocolate time, always. Yeah. Thank you. I will send you a bill later on. Uh, the second part is that, okay, you may not buy an expensive suit, but still whether you need a clothing or something. So I, I may need it later. So if you can shift, uh, there is, most of us probably deal in the categories where some part is, I need it, I always need it. But if, if your category or if your, if your product basket is in the, or the portfolio is in somewhere falling, where the consumer is, has started saying, I don't need it, can you shift a little bit towards I need it later, sir. And there are means and ways that you can do it. Uh, 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 probably that would take another hour to discuss that how to do that, but there are means and ways. The third thing which we did is that we shifted our marketing investment from a broad based uh, uh, perception related expenditure like TV. Like you, you can't measure TV return in that sense, to a more measurable. Uh, uh, advertising like digital you can measure. Okay. So that's broadly what we did in terms of segmenting the consumer that okay, how can I help him to make that decision that okay, I may not need it now, to me. I may need it later. And then also making my investment more measurable, more attributed in terms of sales. And then further making it decentralized, empowering, adapting, adaptability, increasing, agility. So that's broadly. That, that, that's a lot of stuff power packed in that last answer. So, thank you. I love the chocolate part, I love the soup part as well. So, 
then two takeaways from that for me personally. Number one <coughs> is um, you mentioned about empowering the frontline users of your organization with the right decisioning. That can be done only if we have the data, underlying data, decisioning, and delivery. So how can we get control of data decisioning and delivery? Becomes one very fundamental capability that the organization is. The second is, is how do we position? How do we position in a way where we clearly identify the proposition, the purpose of the brand, and how consumers would like to converse with it and take it forward? If I take the first thread theory and, and ask you a question about data decisioning and delivery, market is a is a big is a is a big wide ocean. There are multiple solutions available. For an organization to be able to get hold of the right marketing, marketing stack, how should they go about doing that? And, and also, if you can also touch upon the aspect of what does it take from a CMO standpoint? Do you need to always drive the whole thing, or you can be a catalyst? Because data that you need as a marketer might come in from department one versus department two versus department three. Can you be a catalyst? Can you be a catalyst to stitch, bring down the cycles? That's a, that's a great uh, question, Jay. So, can you be a catalyst? So what I tell my team all the time is, um, there are probably two things that you should be looking at as, I mean in the world that I come from, which is more on the B2B side, as business marketers, Things that you own, which you are responsible for, those KPIs you have to drive, that's a given, check. Second, what do you influence, right? Um, and what I mean by influence is, in many ways, marketing is the common glue, the common fabric. And I can see everybody nodding their heads, you get the sense, and therefore, what you can play a pivot for as you steer those conversations. And data plays a very important. Supratim said, hey, I moved from TV and I moved to digital. Okay, you got the data. But you know what, that's just the start point. What you do with that data, which is a, which is a huge massive flood. And you talked about Martech stack. And, I, and we've all seen pictures of this, right? The number of tech vendors in a marketing stack. It's not a, millimeter of space left on that picture. Is everybody doing every sort of thing? But in my mind, as I try to distill that, is a few few things. One is, can data tell me in today's world, what I was saying earlier, moving away from broad strokes to something more specific, can data tell me who is in the market right now for a purchase? Right? With all that infinite intelligence that you have, digital signals, previous history, etc, etc. Can you tell me who is in market to buy? Second, what can I tell them in a more personalized manner? Now, we all want to get to personalization at the extreme, so I do want to say a very, very personal message to this, but at, a, at an individual level, I think we have to sort of balance that out. We'd love to think that we can give you personal messages, the point that it can actually get annoying at times. So, so draw the right line. So can data tell me who is in market? The second thing that I want data to tell me, so that really helps my team be effective in reaching them. Okay. The second thing to be a clue is can data tell me where am I slipping up? In my entire end-to-end -end funnel of having figured out who is in market, to the finish line of actually having made a transaction with me, where have I slipped up? Was it because I told them the wrong product? <clears throat> the wrong pricing? Terrible experience? Where did I slip up? And therefore, whose onus is it to have to go and fix that? Not everything is a marketing problem, obviously, all of us know. Therefore, who should we be going and telling, hey, you messed up on this or maybe messed up is a strong word, you should have done this better, can we course correct? If, if I can get, a, get data to tell me this, that's plenty. In my previous life, I've been a computer engineer, so I know all the amount of things you can mine up, 
and you think you can solve the world's problems, but hey, you have to get a little bit real as you translate that into business. Those are some very piercing questions for a data analyst to answer clearly. Um, well, on one side, we have Chat GPT almost writing a poem and, and doing fantastic stuff. And, and on another side, we have very fundamental basic questions to be answered. Who is in the market for buying? What should I pitch? How should I pitch? If I didn't pitch it right, what will I have right next time? Yeah, and, and you can actually, it might sound actually futuristic in that sense, because if you break down the problem, and what you just said, Jay, and I'm sure you're probably deep into that space, you can start building rudimentary models and so on, and then you, you sort of refine that as you're going forward, right? So that's for the first part. But the second one is actually pretty straightforward. It's not, I mean, relative terms, it's straightforward. You get signals on it, where am I slipping up? And all of us realize, we don't want perfect data. Right? I don't want to know absolutely fine that this was the only reason why that happened because there's a variety of things in an uncertain environment, which is certainly the case from now onwards, that we have to have that judgment call. Right? So that's pretty much what it is. So I don't want to say it's an over-engineered solution, but it's reasonably okay to help us on the right track. Sure. No, that, that really is it's fantastic trading. Uh, I'll just add one thing. Yeah. It is saying that, that a little bit maybe a contribute. I think Till the time the data privacy law uh, is setting in a full force and then uh, other than the first party cookie you cannot or the, uh, or the zero level cookie you cannot do anything in any marketing other thing. Till that time it is coming. I think data, the amount of data is not the issue. The issue is the actionability of the data. The collection of the data is, is, is more or less sorted now. You get a lot of data. Uh, you can buy it, you can own it uh, in terms of uh, your handles and other assets. The point is that what do you do with that data, how do you analyze data, that data, and then what do what is the action of the data? I think I'm saying that linkage, uh, we are uh, as a marketer, uh, a lot of us are struggling to connect that data that we get. The data is there, data is analyzed also, but then what do we do with that? Yeah. No, I think that there is absolute uh, appreciation of data's requirement its quality and, and our ability to then use it for, for making decisions and empowering our frontline users to make right right delivery of messages. Although we want to extend um, on, on that topic and then I have a question on talent which I will then move into. As we all agree, I think the importance of data is, uh, you know, it's unquestionable. But however, I mean, it's a very personal viewpoint that I always see that uh, you have the data, you understand, you analyze. But there's also as a marketer, as I again go back, the consumer being at the core of it, consumer centricity and how well you know the consumer and therefore at times you need to also challenge your gut in terms of how you analyze the data and what you bring out of them. Because it cannot be always a cookie cutter way of uh, doing things. So therefore that little risk factor as a marketer you need to take. Because otherwise, it's very safe to go by data and then make mistakes as if yeah, I have data by my bag. But uh, I think as a as a marketer, who, uh, having a bit of a risk uh, appetite as well, and if you have the confidence of knowing the consumer, bringing the relevance, analyzing the entire environment at that given point in time, I think it's very important to uh, uh, you know risk that little gut element of it as well to to take your initiatives forward. And I have one more question when you are stopping. Um, you mentioned about the regulation of how we use first party data and, and we don't want to spook the customer when they are on our website. Hey, give me your phone number, your email address and before you do anything else on my website, I want everything. Right? That, that kind of is a, is a given recipe for us. It's very interesting. Um, so, th this is a very difficult situation for marketers and brands to manage. What is the virtuous cycle that brands can create where the customers see value in slowly sharing more information so that they have more value that they can perceive from the brand. Are there any any recommendations that you would like to share from experience, etc. where where you know how do you how do you get customers to feel safe when they are when they are conversing with you? And then you build your data rather than saying hey give me all your data and then I'm gonna tell you what is the right product for you. Well, the most important first I'm talking here as a consumer that when I want to share my data with 
it's always that which brand I'm sharing it with. So I think that is something very important. That itself is, you know, a tick mark which is there because when you feel that you are, you know, sharing something with a completely new set of brands or new set of, uh, you know, organizations, you have a bit of a, uh, you know, resistance for it. So therefore, when uh, the most one important thing is how the how the brand that you're working with, what kind of trust factor that brand has. I think that is something very important and it, it also is very crucial for a person to share that data. Having said that, as I said that in terms of with that data what you do and that is something very important and how sensitive you are to use that data rather than bombarding uh, consumers with offers and bombarding things. But then it depends on what kind of category you are in as well. You know, I mean, if I'm going into a uh, you know, an Amazon of the world where you're going only for a discount is a completely different, uh, you know, ball game. But having said that, with, with other stuff, it's very important that judiciary to use that data, that is very important as a brand to be responsible to use that data because uh, you cannot, once you miss that trust on the consumer, the consumer is going to come back to you because you need to walk with the consumer, create that loyal tribe around you because they are your biggest testimonials uh, for, uh, for the strength of very really powerful that not only you increase the trust index as you be very careful about how you use the data but, but also get them to come back to you again again. Yeah, I just want to add that uh, sure. I want to extend the argument of data to engagement. So it's not just about data. Consumers, for in the case of FMCG, uh, first party data is something which is still an evolution. It's a journey way far away from it. But consumers will engage with you if you stand for something which they believe in and it is true to you. Authenticity is very important. I think a lot of times, uh, this visual spoke about it, that brands have to take a stand and we should take a stand. But I think the stand has to be within the circumference which you define for your brand. If you try to be someone different or if you try to take a cause which is very different from what you stand for, is when the pitfalls would be way more than the benefits. Just to give an example, for, you know, uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but Hershey's, like the her and she is not noticed in the Hershey's branding. Likewise, uh, the achievements of several her and she that go unnoticed, which is where we launched a campaign on the International Women's Day called the Hershey campaign, which is celebrating the she goes around you. Now that came in very straight from the heart as far as the brand is concerned, and people lapped it up in a big way. Had it not had a strong link with the brand, then there would have been repercussions as well. So I think that's the argument which I want to extend beyond just data. See, consumers will engage with you if you are authentic and if you stay true to yourself, versus just saying something for the sake of it. Now, very important. Keep the mic on. The question I have for you, Ankit, is while we be authentic in our messaging with with consumers, what does it take for an organization? What does it take from a talent perspective? Do you see the teams in marketing functions are required to have skills? Is it only just what we do outside or there is more to do for brands and corporations to do inside as well? What talent do you see? Absolutely, because uh, you know, uh, technology is an enabler, but eventually it's people who drive uh, brands and, and build brands, right? So from that perspective, I think uh, one being staying very, very close to the consumer. There is absolutely no substitute to it. And not just the data, the insights. Second, there are, it has to come from a place of passion. And third, while I do feel that empowerment is important, but at the end of the day, there are some people who hold the brand core values and ethos. And no matter what, if you see that uh, being disturbed, then there has to be a red flag saying that this is not what the brand stands for. So even if you do tactical things, they can't be brand dilutive. And I think that holding that, uh, is important uh, internally for people to view it externally. Correct. Right. How about you, from a talent standpoint, uh, what are your viewpoints that an organization must change and should do? See, I think uh, my starting comment was about that, okay, when you, you are fighting recession, you need to take care of your people. And the marketing partner talent which you have. So uh, that is key. But I think as the topic is about how you decision for the brand, 
and we are in the ET based brand con conclave. I think the best pill against recession is having a very strong brand. That a strong brand will insulate. And though I would not advocate a recession, but I will say that there is a good part of recession is that it actually is a kind of acid test that whether your brand can is, is strong enough. Because uh, in, in a relatively prolonged recession, uh, if you see the data, a lot of weak brands weed out. Okay. And if you are a strong brand, good brand, you will survive the recession. And the interesting part is that usually the post recession, how you handle the situation. And if you are a good brand, if you managed your brand well in, during the recession, there is a springboard jumping you can do once the recession period is over. And we are seeing post pandemic in a lot of cases, a lot of strong brands have been fantastically well. Uh, the brands which were there in the, in the a very tough situation uh, during pandemic. But now they are revenge tourism, revenge buying, everything is happening. And consumers are actually getting engaged with those brands which they trusted, the strong brands which survived the recession or the pandemic. Uh, they are going back to those brands. So, in a way, recession is a kind of acid test how strong your brand is. And if you can survive, probably you will try. Fantastic. So, two minutes on the clock before we wrap up. I'm, I'm going to request each of our panel members here to give us a wisdom quote, um, which is which is one one thing from your experience. Um, start with you, Shreeri, if you have thought of one already. What do you think is is one thing that you want to leave all of us behind? Yeah, um, and I also tie it back to the people part, right? mm -hmm. which was the previous question. I think the main thing that I would sort of uh, encourage, and I myself am trying to do that, is you should lead with empathy during these times. Okay, that's the main headline in my mind uh, as you deal with this. Part of the reason is because if you look at it internally from your team perspective, everybody is going through a lot. In fact, we've gone through a lot over the last three years and we continue to do so. So empathy, leading with that, your talent, your people, uh, you know, I think that will speak a lot. And obviously things like rescaling, etc. Things within the within the thing. The other piece I want to quickly mention on that is you know the way decisions are also taken, right? You have to be cognizant of the fact that under ambiguity when you're making decisions, you have to be careful of how much of churn it is going to cause downstream as well. Right? So empathy, lead with that with your people. And obviously the same thing needs to rub off to your customers as well and the way you talk to them. So, how about you? Uh, Steven, uh, continuing from the people point, I think it's one I mean, in agreement with what uh, what's being said here. But also one of the things I think is very important also uh, to extend that with your, not just the core team, but also the partners that you work with. I think that is very important because, uh, you know, marketing works with partners across different genres. I mean, your advertising partner, your media partner, your digital agencies. So therefore, they are part of your core team. I mean, they are not the immediate team, but part of your overall team. I think uh, the entire empathy or the way we look at things, that's very important during these times to be working with them. And uh, because the intuitiveness, I mean, it comes across that, okay, when it comes to cost cutting, the first thing that goes in is, you know, cut the cost of uh, the advertising cost, etc. But uh, it's not the cost, but again, looking at the long term, I think one needs to be cognizant about that as well. And in terms of, uh, you know, how about just a thought, I think in today's context, it's very important that you relive what today stands for and therefore be relevant and add value to a consumer's life and also tell the story in a very true manner and an authentic manner. I think that's what the brand should leave. And that's my message. Right, I think we only have 15 seconds if you have any final thoughts before we wrap up. Ankit? Okay. No, I think similar. Uh, similar? Four or five ingredients. Uh, yeah. Marketing and strategic thinking. Yeah. Business orientation. Empathy. Authenticity. And I think the pandemic has taught us that whoever holds strong will gain in the long term. Great. So I think you're okay for now. Yes, but two lines. I think you, as a leader, what you can do is you uh, go up the top. 
and, uh, and and the consistency of the communication when there is a tough time, be it recession or be it anything, uh, the consistency of the communication should be there with your team. And as uh, Madhu is talking about, with all your partners also, be transparent, be authentic, and work the talk. Fantastic. I think I would like to summarize um, awesome, awesome inputs from all four of our panelists here. We spoke about how it is important for a strong brand to to not only just stay relevant during the recession, but otherwise overtake, go ahead of competition as well. Lead with empathy, have the right messaging, be authentic to your purpose, not with your people only, but with your partners. Keep customers at the center. Uh, make sure that data, technology, and the whole markets type of big picture is not overwhelming, but you increase your needle towards using AI in the way your organization's requirement of being agile is taken care of. And with that, I would like to thank you very much, all of you.